channel open. Welcome back to Weekly Trek, a proud member of the Tricorder Transmissions podcast network. I am your host, Alex Perry. What's today's date? The date. Today's show was recorded on August the 10th, 2019, and is current through the end of Star Trek Discovery Season 2, so beware of spoilers. All right, let's get into the show. Good day, Voyager, and welcome to A Briefing with Neelix. It's a catchy title, isn't it? Weekly Trek is a 30-minute news show covering the biggest stories from the Star Trek franchise. We are in a new golden age of Star Trek. There are five television shows at some point in production, possibly more on the way, and enough merchandise to fill the Bajoran wormhole. So stick with me and I'll help you sort the real facts from a lot of the Dominion propaganda that you'll find online. But I can't do this alone, and my guest this week is Seth Walker. Seth, welcome to Weekly Trek. Thanks, Alex. I appreciate it. I uh, really enjoy being here. Seth, I ask this of my guests every week. I want to know something that's got you feeling excited about Star Trek at the moment. What's got <laughs> you moving at Warp 10? Oh, man. Water, water everywhere. And it's it's all <laughs> potable, man. It's all You can drink it all. There's just so much great stuff going on. I think, though, what I'll focus on is Lower Decks, because that has been the biggest surprise in terms of excitement for me. I thought it was kind of a cool idea to have this uh, animated show. I wasn't really too invested in it but with all the announcements and the passion shown by the people talking about it and when i saw the art and the costume design you know the uniform design man i am all in for that show in a way that i'm surprised about so that that's what's turning me into a space salamander yeah lower decks has really kind of snuck up on me in many ways i remember the first day it was announced thinking you know i'm not sure necessarily that the show is for me obviously i think there are lots yep. of people for whom it will be for and i think i even said something on twitter that day about you know I don't think this one's going to be for me. I'm definitely not going to denigrate anybody for whom it is. And I've done a total 180 on that. I mean, I'm 100% on board for this show. And I think, as I said, sitting in the in the convention hall at, at Star Trek Las Vegas last week and hearing Mike McMahon in the writer's room talk about that show and the things that they were saying and the way they've been talking about it, I have a lot of confidence that this is going to be certainly a show that you know fits right in when it comes to to the Star Trek ethos. You know, hopefully it will also be a great show that is very funny, but I think they're certainly taking the source material very, very seriously. Yeah, and I think the level of uh, creativity they can show in terms of, you know, an animated show and the budget they've got to do the quote-unquote effects, it's going to give us this massive platform. I mean, I agree with you. I think I was one of the people who might have replied to your, your tweet that was like, yep, you know, I'm glad there's so much Trek out there for everybody that I don't have to be excited about all of it but this has come around and i mean just seeing how much love they've got for the source material and I, i'm re i'm really i'm really looking forward to seeing some actual promo stuff come out of this more than just the few stills we've seen and especially this idea of focusing on the b stories of star trek episodes right star trek discovery we'll see on star trek picard but i i think it will it will be the same way are very much a plot shows you know that that old kind of episodic format of having an a plot and a b plot to each episode that kind of get wrapped by the end of the episodes the sort of main flagship star trek shows aren't really like that anymore right well i mean not just a plot but like you know they were saying a plot hero squad you know you've got b plot b squad guys coming in here you know the description of second contact really kind of excites me i mean just thinking about a show that's kind of dealing with the chief o'brien level of nuts and bolts and making sure that you know all of the infrastructure is in place for this actual joining of the federation or whatever i just i find that i don't know why maybe my career in logistics but i just find it really exciting it's something we don't really get to see too much except when there's a b plot of majority or you know climbing around the jeffries tubes or o'brien getting rid of the cardassian voles i mean you know it's it's never been the focus so that that'll be a cool change yeah, I think for anybody who has been, you know, missing those two-story episodes, I think Lower Decks is a way of scratching that itch, uh, knowing that it's probably unlikely that, you know, Discovery and certainly Picard, the way they've been talking about it as a 10-hour movie, 
I don't think those shows are necessarily going to give us those two plot lines. But now we've got, rather than having one show that has an A plot and a B plot, we now have two shows, one that's an A plot show and one that's a B plot show. And I think it will it will holistically give us that sort of full Star Trek experience across multiple different shows. It's a beautiful thing just to be able to see all these different places you can go and you don't have to ask for everything from one show. You know, Discovery doesn't do X and Z, but it does A, B, and C. You know, instead of that, you can you can look for X and Z somewhere else and get all sorts of great Trek stuff. Like you say, it's a golden era. I am excited. I'm going to switch us from Lower Decks to actually, I guess, Voyager. The thing that I'm feeling uh, really excited about this week is obviously since, you know, the reveal that Jerry Ryan would be reprising to play her role as Seven of Nine on Star Trek Picard. I've been going back and sort of watching my way through the sort of Seven of Nine character arc on Star Trek Voyager, beginning with Scorpion running all the way through Endgame. And you have lots of episodes in between that really touch on the character and her motivations, like the Raven and like Hope and Fear, like Dark Frontier, Unimatrix Zero. That character was really well served by the writer's yeah. room over the last four seasons of that show. And I am really, really excited to see where the character is, you know, 20 years removed from that. You definitely see a decent amount of growth over the course of those four years, but now it's been five times that length of time leading up to Star Trek Picard. And so, you know, that for me, that's super, super exciting to see how that character has continued to evolve because it felt like we were moving in a really interesting direction by the end of Voyager in which the character was showing signs of wanting to embrace more of a human personality to sort of experience the full richness of, of human life. And certainly the one very small snippet we got in the Picard trailer indicates that kind of journey has continued for that character and certainly sounds from Jerry Ryan talking at STLV last week like the character themselves made an intentional choice to really lean into their humanity. And I think that's probably tied into the wider plot of the show. But super excited that we get to revisit this character. It was a really fabulous arc, and that's got me feeling very excited. Seth, you're a Seven of Nine fan? I, I definitely did not like Seven of Nine at first. The whole um, cat suit and like just repelling from something that was obviously meant to sort of draw the male gaze bothered me a lot initially. But when I watched the Voyager and I really got into it, she became my favorite character because she was just so well crafted. And like you said, the White Riders Room did her such such great work. And so I, I'm really excited to see. Cause, I mean, as she said in her panel, despite the amount of growth that the character went through, her talking patterns didn't change because she was still, you know, associating at least mentally a lot with her Borg origins. I mean, she had more time as a Borg than a human. It makes sense. But just to see in the brief bit we got in the Picard trailer that that has completely changed, how that happens, what brings her to that, you know, are we going to get any sort of mentions of her and Chakotay? I mean, there's a lot of really cool things. I'm, I was spoiled because I saw people talking about Jerry Ryan being in the trailer right before I was able to watch it, but it still got a little fanboy squeal out of me when I saw her. She uh, was, is one of my, if not my ultimate favorite Voyager character. Totally, totally. Yeah, for me, it was, that was probably the biggest moment of that trailer because it was the most unexpected reveal, yeah. given that there had been rumors floating around that, that Data was would be making a reappearance, but there were no rumors that that Seven of Nine was going to be in that show. Unbelievable how in 2019 they were able to get away with that. I mean, I've heard the links they went to, but still no, you know, data leaked. And that was like, ah, it's data. You kind of expect it. Seven of Nine, surprise on that day. I mean, oh my Lord, that was that was an impressive thing the CBS pulled off. All right. Well, with that, let's turn to the week's top stories. There's a war going on in I'm a reporter. And it has been such a busy few weeks for news that uh, we're actually doing news stories that are one week, two weeks old, but we just haven't had time to get to with all of the crush of news out of San Diego Comic-Con and out of STLV. There has just been so much going on over the last few weeks that we still have a full episode and even a couple of news stories that we're not going to do because it's been so busy. But we'll start this week with the a tweet about the Nickelodeon Star Trek show. This is a show that there has not been a huge amount of news on out of San Diego Comic-Con and STLV. That was to be expected. It's 
the newest of the shows that has been announced. And so it's much further behind the curve in having things that they're ready to talk about. But uh, there was a tweet from the Hageman brothers, who are the creators for the Star Trek Nickelodeon show that introduced us to the writer's room for the show. The team is a mix of folks who have, you know, I would say some are bringing pretty lengthy credits in the animated world to the writer's room, some who are real newcomers. A couple of standout folks in the room, Aaron Waltke, who actually worked with the Hageman brothers on the Troll Hunters show that they also created, has been hired. I've seen some speculation online from Trek Movie that he might be the showrunner for uh, this show as well, since he also served that role on Troll Hunters. One of the things that was very cool is to now see, you know, those writers start expressing their excitement about working on a Star Trek show now that the news is out. And I think the other thing I was pretty excited by is that the room itself is pretty diverse. I counted 11 members of the writer's room, five women and three people of color, which is, you know, a good step in the right direction. We don't know anything about this show. I've seen floating around online potentially that CBS has been doing another round of trademarking, including trademarking the name Star Trek Prodigy. That would sound like it would fit a Nickelodeon show, but you know we really don't know if, if that is going to be until they make a formal announcement. There have been plenty of other rumored names for shows like Star Trek Destiny and Star Trek Reliant, none of which have ultimately panned out as being names of shows that we have announced. So it's possible that Prodigy will be the same, but also possible that it will be the name of the Nickelodeon show. But, you know, I think it will be a little while until we get uh, more information about the Nickelodeon show. But Seth, this seems like a step in the right direction, don't you think? Oh, completely. And I mean, this is, again, one of these surprises. I was I was more excited about this than Lower Decks just because I have a, a young six-year-old. So I thought this would be a great way to get him into the Star Trek world. But again, like you stated, seeing the joy out of a number of these creatives just for being a part of the Star Trek universe gives me confidence that this is going to be run the right way and gets me excited as well. I mean, these guys also grew up on The Next Generation. You know, They grew up on my Star Trek. I mean, I love the original series, but my Star Trek has always been The Next Generation. And to have these people now in charge of creating things that I can share with, you know, future generations i think this is great that the diversity amongst the creatives it's you know star trek is really working hard to live towards those ideals that they put forth out on their shows and that's uh, incredibly commendable and something that i'm i'm very proud of seeing the excitement of these writers see it frankly seeing the excitement of of any of these guys whether it's the lower decks writers room last week whether it's folks like Jonathan Frakes and Brent Spiner and Jerry Ryan and Jonathan Del Arco. And now, you know, seeing on Twitter, the Nickelodeon writer's room, just real palpable excitement over the project that they're working on. I mean, it just can't help but get you fired up about it. You know, knowing that they're bringing a level of passion to the work that they're doing certainly helps in terms of firing up my imagination and want for the show, even not having any information about it other than the small snippets we've gotten that this is about a group of teenagers who find a derelict starship and then set off on some kind of adventure. You know, it sounds great. And I'm definitely kind of like a vampire feeding off of the excitement <laughs> of the people who are involved in it. And we don't even know when this takes place, correct? I mean, you just gave the entire amount of detail that we know about the content of the show. That's right. We know it's a Star Trek show on Nickelodeon. We know that kind of one line snippet about what the show is. But beyond that, we know nothing. The sandbox that they're playing in right now, that just, that's so exciting because this could be 2,000 years in the future. They could literally find discovery after the Calypso, you know, encounter. I mean, this, it's just, it's, it's really exciting. I, I'm, I'm really excited just thinking about the vast swath of the Star Trek universe that they could land in. Yeah, I mean, they could be doing anything. It could be 23rd century around the time of TOS. It could be 24th century around the time of the next generation. It could be set in the same, same time frame as Lower Decks is set, oh. which is right after Voyager. It could be set in the same time frame as Star Trek Picard. It could be a thousand years in the future, you know, around the time that that discovery arrives after season two. It could be, you know, around the time of Calypso, if if those two are different. It could be back in the NX01 time period and Star Trek <laughs> 
know, there's Ooh. there's lots of very exciting possibilities there. Yeah, this is this is a good time to be a Star Trek fan for sure. I, I'm, I'm very thankful. Now, carrying ourselves from Nickelodeon to Star Trek Picard, we got a little bit of news about behind the scenes of Star Trek Picard, which is that. Jeff Russo, who's currently scoring Star Trek Discovery, will be scoring Star Trek Picard as well. It's not a huge surprise that Jeff Russo will be the composer for Star Trek Picard. It's pretty clear that he was the talent behind the scoring of both of the Star Trek Picard trailers that we've gotten to date. And so it makes sense, therefore, that he would be scoring the main series as well. I picked out at least a few refrains from the Final Frontier track, which is on the Star Trek Discovery season two soundtrack in the Picard trailers. But really exciting. I think the work that Jeff Russo has been doing, particularly in season two for Star Trek Discovery, has been really, really, you know, excellent Star Trek music. And I'm very excited that uh, he will be doing Picard as well. And Hanalee Culpepper, who is uh, the director of Star Trek Picard episodes one and two, also uh, in a series of Instagram posts was featuring some of the other behind the scenes talent for Star Trek Picard. So we now have names for the prop master, which is Jeff Lombardi, the costume designer, Christine Baselin clark The cinematographer for episodes one and two was Philip Lanyon. And I think most interestingly, Todd Chanuski, who was the production designer for Star Trek Discovery season one before Tamara Deverell took over for the back half of season one and has continued in that production designer role up in Toronto. Todd will be the production designer for Star Trek Picard. So there will be, you know, some content continuity and personnel across the two shows, even though they're filming on separate sides of the continent. So we've got Jeff Russo, we've got Todd Chanewski, and a number of directors uh, of Star Trek Discovery have also flown to LA to shoot episodes of Star Trek Picard, like uh, Jonathan Frakes, like Hanalee Culpepper, who's directed a few episodes of, of Star Trek Discovery, like Doug Aronofsky, who was just announced as a Picard director, has directed, I think, three, maybe four episodes of Discovery now. So despite the fact they are shooting in different cities, there is a decent amount of crossover between the two productions and excited to see you know, some of the work that some of these newcomers will be doing. I think the costume design that we've seen in the trailer so far has been super interesting, on par with the kind of work that Gersha Phillips has been doing for Star Trek Discovery. But Seth, we've gotten a decent amount of in front of the camera news over the last few weeks. It's kind of cool to get some additional behind the scenes insights into the show as well. Definitely. I love Gersha Phillips and all of her work. And so it's good to see that move on. And I mean, Jeff Russo, like you were saying, season two has been one of the, if not the very first Star Trek series that I've actually, in the course of watching an episode the first time, you know, been taken aback by the power of the score. I remember that in a couple episodes in season two. And so having him come on to Picard is a brilliant thing. I mean, I'm a big fan of the continuity between different music scores. I mean, I, I find, you know, James Horner and you know j just these classic uh, musical composers of, of movies and things to be very awesome glue. And so I'm excited about Jeff Russo moving on to Picard quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. He's done a lot of interesting work with, with kind of integrating the original TOS theme into the Star Trek Discovery soundtrack, I will be very interested to see how he integrates the Next Generation theme into Picard. Oh man, how he pulled that in when we first saw the Enterprise at the end of season one and every time it was it was layered out throughout season two. It was it was so tastefully done and sparse enough that every single time it got that, you know, pit of your stomach feeling You're like, oh this is this is it. This is this is the Star Trek I, I love. And so yeah. Love that guy. Yeah, we're in we're in good good hands certainly when it comes to the music for Picard. Our next story this week is that Star Trek The Motion Picture will be returning to movie theaters in honor of its 40th anniversary. This is the 40th anniversary of the premiere of Star Trek The Motion Picture, and on September the 15th and 18th here in the United States, you can head back to the cinema to watch Star Trek The Motion Picture on the big screen. This is hosted by Fathom Events, who've done a number of kind of rebroadcasts of Star Trek movies in theaters. Fathom Events also did the Next Generation High Definition cinematic events for seasons one, two, and three while the Blu-rays were coming out. And so super exciting that we'll get the opportunity to see the motion picture on the big screen again in a number of theaters across the US. Head to uh, fathomevents.com to find out 
where the motion picture is showing in your area. It's showing and in at least a couple of theaters around the Washington, D.C. area. So I think uh, when the Fathom events happen, they're, they're pretty widespread. They also did the Deep Space Nine documentary uh, cinematic showing. So if you were at a cinema to see the DS9 documentary, it's likely that same cinema will be doing the motion picture as well. One note, since we talked about it a couple of weeks ago, how there have been ongoing discussions around potentially doing a remaster of the director's edition of Star Trek The Motion Picture. This showing in cinemas will not be that director's edition. We're probably at least six months away from seeing that. This will be a rebroadcast of the uh, theatrical edition of the motion picture, which is the one that's currently available on Blu-ray. But that doesn't stop it from being an exciting time. Uh, Obviously, opinions are mixed about the quality of the motion picture, but you certainly cannot disagree that the visuals of that movie, in many cases, particularly of the Enterprise, are really stunning. And so it's a good opportunity to see that on the big screen rather than just on your home cinema. Seth, is this something you think you might be heading to? I'll definitely be heading to it. My last uh, Fathom events experience was the DS9 dock, and that was a great... (laughs) It was a great experience. Just, it was, you know, a mini, 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 mini convention, but just a bunch of Star Trek nerds getting together for some good Star Trek fun. But, you know, I, I've got one of those uh, unpopular opinions where I'm not a fan of the motion pictures. So I was a little bit disappointed that it wasn't the director's cut, something that would be a little more of a draw. But as you stated, it is definitely one of the greatest examples of the filmmaking of the time 2001 space odyssey the movie it's got some great starship porn uh, cuts i mean it's it's a beautiful film and i'd love to try to get back and, and enjoy it in a theater maybe that'll be the hook that makes me an actual fan of that movie yeah the director's edition is definitely a big improvement over the theatrical edition and there are people who love it and there are people who don't love it i don't think it's all that unpopular to say that it's not a great movie it's certainly not one of my favorites but i will be there watching it on the big screen, and I'm sure I will have a great time enjoying Jerry Goldsmith's score, enjoying the fabulous cinematography, enjoying the fabulous visual effects, and some of the great performances. I mean, Leonard Nimoy does a really fabulous uh, job in that movie, showing a very tortured Spock and his kind of journey back towards reconciliation of his Vulcan and human halves. Um, so there is, a, there is a lot to enjoy about that movie, uh, even though I agree with you, I don't necessarily think it's the best that Star Trek had to offer. Well, yeah, and I- I totally agree. There's a lot about that movie that I enjoy. I love, you know, just the way that they expanded the the Vulcan mythology, showing us Kolinar and getting to see the new <laughs> first time ever redesigned Klingons. You know, there's a lot of cool things, especially the ship. And I'm one of those few people that likes the uniforms quite a bit. But I just, yeah, it's it's a movie that it's hard for me to get through without falling asleep more than Well, our last story this week is for Star Trek Discovery and the announcement that there will be a virtual reality experience for Star Trek Discovery rolling out in cities across the world. This will be coming in the fall of 2019 in San Francisco and Hong Kong with more locations on the way. Sandbox VR will be launching the first quote-unquote holodeck experience. Uh, The name of it will be Star Trek Discovery Away team. And in this experience, you and five others will form an away team in which you will put on virtual reality headsets and then head through an experience in which you will be guided on an alien planet by Ensign Sylvia Tilly aboard the USS Discovery as you solve a mystery. And along the way, we'll be using a number of familiar Star Trek devices like tricorders, phasers, in order to aid you along your mission. Um, So as I say, this will launch in the fall of this year in San Francisco and Hong Kong. It looks like it will then later launch in LA, New York, Austin, San Diego, and Chicago, with Vancouver, Jakarta, Macau, and Singapore also possible locations because Sandbox has facilities there and potentially others too. Uh, along the way. Uh, I'm actually really looking forward to this. There is a a Star Wars virtual reality experience in Las Vegas that I did while I was there last year, and it was a ton of fun. I mean, you put on you put on this kind of vest, and you put on the VR headset, and then you basically go through this maze, and projected around you is the video and the sound, and you really do feel like you're, you know, where you are. I mean, the, the walls are where the walls are supposed to be, and, you know, 
know, when you manipulate things, you're also manipulating them in the game as well. And, you know, that was fun in a Star Wars context, but I am very excited for it in a Star Trek context as well. And I hope that I find myself in a city at which this is available because I think I'll probably do it four or five times when it gets there. Seth, have you ever done one of these VR things? Not since the 90s. I did I did one way back then. And so the description has been kind of nebulous. I'd like to hear from you a little bit more about this Star Wars thing. Like you said the walls are where the walls are supposed to be. So was it you would walk forward in this combined area and where the physical wall was, there was also a computer generated wall? That's right. Yeah. So when I did the Star Wars one, it actually broke halfway through. So I <laughs> take off my uh, headset and see the room that we were in. So you're in basically this this big room, and it is it's basically a maze. Um, it, these these kind of gray painted walls, and you sort of walk through this little maze. And as you're walking through the maze. You know, and it's got doors along the way. So you're basically moving from room to room to room. And in each room you arrive, different things happen. You know, in the Star Wars one, you sort of have to shoot things. But there was also a a sequence in which you were trying to open a door and you needed to punch in on a keypad in a certain sequence, a series of colors in order to get the door to open. And... The door is closed. I mean, you reach out your hand, you can feel a closed door and you're seeing a closed door as part of the VR experience. And then you look over at the keypad, you walk over to the keypad and there's a physical keypad there. And as you press the buttons in the VR, you're pressing the buttons on the keypad and it would blink you a series of colors and you would have to hit the keys in the right sequence of colors in order to open the door. You hit the right sequence of colors the doors open, you walk back over to the closed door that was a physical closed door that you were also seeing in the VR experience and and the door opens. And just as the physical door opens, you're seeing the door in the VR headset open as well. And then you move into the next room and the the experience continues. It, It really is amazing how they've tied both the physical experience of what your of what your hands are able to touch with what you're seeing in your headset uh, and there's also another moment where you know you start off not having a weapon and you're a stormtrooper so you there's a piece in the game where you reach out and you grab a blaster rifle and lo and behold your hand closes around an actual physical blaster rifle wow. and you pick it up and that's what you carry around for the rest of it and then in the game you have that rifle too um, it really is a, a super fun experience, and I'm 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 really really happy that they're going to have the Star Trek element to it, and also that they were talking about you know not just Star Wars is really easy because it's a shoot 'em up game. You know, you just kind of walk into a room and start blasting things. That's sort of the Star Wars way of doing things. I'm really interested to see how they build in sort of some of the more Star Trekky approaches, which is a little more kind of of the problem solving variety rather than necessarily just the combat variety. I mean, I'm sure there'll be you know some some shooting of phases in the process as well but it'll be interesting to see kind of other what kind of other experiences they build in in addition to that well yeah i gotta be honest i wasn't excited at all about this until i heard about the how the star wars one was laid out i was imagining a very lame 90s lawnmower man-esque type of thing that's what i did the only vr real experience i've had and that sounds awesome i imagine there's going to be a lot of mist style puzzles to kind of bring it over to Star Trek instead of Star Wars. You know, you'll have to figure out how to, to turn some knobs and push some buttons. That, that, that sounds really cool. I'm, I'm very excited now that I've heard the description of how the Star Wars VR thing went. Yeah, the technology has advanced a lot. And I mean, it's even pretty different from the kind of home rigs that people have because those tend to be, you know, you put the headset on, but you remain stationary physically. And right then move around the environment via, you know, a a handset or something like that. Right. And that's what I was imagining. And that's not super cool to me because it's really just like a wraparound screen around your face. And that just as a glasses wearer, it's a little bit difficult anyways. And so, you know, I'm excited to hear that this is sort of more holodeck-y and that you're walking about. There's physical walls you interact with and, and things of that nature. That's really cool. Yeah, and my wife and I enjoyed it so much. We did it three times over the two <laughs> days that we were at the Venetian last year before SCLV. And I remember thinking at the time, you know, it would be pretty cool if they did a Star Trek version of these. And, uh, <laughs> to see a year later, they've they've come through. The gold is everywhere, Alex. It's everywhere. That's right. It sure is. <laughs> All right. Well, we've talked about the facts. Now let's speculate on what's going to happen in the future of Star Trek. You make some very good points, Captain. 
but it's still all speculation and theory. So each week, I and my guests will give you a theory or a wish that we're nurturing about the future of the Star Trek franchise, whether it's Discovery, Picard, Lower Decks, any of the shows, new shows we've not thought of, old shows, products. So Seth, let me hear your theory or wish for this week. Well, I made a big, bold prediction that we were getting an announcement for a uh, Pike Enterprise show at STLV. And that, like most of my bold predictions, was was proven false. I still hope and wish for this Pike at Star Trek show. That is really something that I want. I mean, outside of great success for the shows that, that exist, I would love to see more of Anson Mount's Captain Pike just doing his thing, flying about the galaxy on the bridge of the USS Enterprise. Yeah, it seems like everybody wants to do it. Uh, Anson was asked about it. Uh, at STLV on stage, and he seemed, you know, pretty up for it. Ethan Peck was asked the same thing. He seemed pretty up for it. Kurtzman asked the question at San Diego Comic-Con, you know, is that something yep. you're interested in doing? It felt like from from the moment we arrived at STLV that, that it was going to be a pretty not quiet convention, but that it wasn't going to have the same kind of huge announcement that we got last year. It certainly sounds like there is a ton of interest, both from behind the scenes and in front of the camera, to doing some kind of Pike show. It, it sounds to me like they are probably still, you know, trying to figure out the logistics of doing it. You know, there's clearly a lot of interest from the fan base. We really want it. I think, you know, it, it would behoove them to find some way to provide that to us. And, and I think, you know, one of the ways they could do that if it is logistically too difficult to set up a new show because, you know, they already have so many shows they're working on, not just in Canada, but also in Southern California. Uh, you know, maybe there's some, you know, we're getting the short tracks, obviously, but maybe there's an expanded version of that, you know, like a, like a short miniseries, you know, three episodes, something like that, which would be much more logistically easy to shoot and would also help kind of fill that desire that the fan base has. I would, I would love some sort of solution like that. You know, if they don't do a full show, just a, a little, you know, limited run thing, that'd be great. I just, I really love Dance and Mount's Pike and I enjoyed Rebecca Romaine and I enjoyed Ethan Peck. Is a good group of people and it was something that I feel like a lot of the fan base was missing that classic Starfleet style that Mount brought to Pike. You know that was kind of it was kind of later seasons Picard in a way and and I would just love to to get a little bit more of that flavor. And we will get just a taste more coming through the short tracks, which ties into my wish for this week, which is I really want CBS to give us a premiere date for these short tracks. <laughs> yes, season. we know there are six on the way. There's probably not six months between now and when Star Trek Picard premieres. I think we're now even assuming that it premieres in February around the same time that The Last Best Hope, the Picard tie-in novel, is published. That's still only five months from now. So we know they're going to have to roll these out probably at a quicker pace than one a month. But even if you, even if you were putting like three weeks in between them, the first... One, you know, has to come pretty soon. Uh, and I'm ready to find out when new Star Trek's going to be on the air. You know, April was when Discovery Season 2 finished. It's now closing in on the middle of August. We know there's a bunch of stuff coming. I would like to put a date on my calendar to know when I have things to look forward to. Again, it all feels still a little kind of unreal because there's no, you know, there's no premiere date attached to it. So I'm ready. So if CBS would do me a huge favor of letting <laughs> Let me know when we can expect the short tracks to start premiering. I would really appreciate it. Alex, this is the living example of Trek privilege. <laughs> that, that we are <laughs> impatient for information about the upcoming shows that we're guaranteed of. When where, What were we sitting at five years ago? You know, totally, totally. And I will fully cop to <laughs> being a whiny, demanding Star Trek fan who wants it all now, now, now. But uh, <laughs> if they could see to giving me a premiere date for short treks in the next few weeks, I would I would be a happy guy indeed. I'm on board the USS Trek privilege, man. I want that. <laughs> <laughs> I think at this point, I'm closing in on being the captain. <laughs> Trek privilege. Awesome. <laughs> Do you have a theory or wish for the Star Trek franchise that you'd like to share? Tweet them to me at Weekly Trek, and I might feature your theory in a future episode. Well, that's all the time we've got for this episode of Weekly Trek. Thank you so much to my guest, Seth Walker, for joining me today. Seth, how can people contact you if they want to continue the conversation? Thanks again for having me, Alex. This was a blast. I love talking about Trek. And if you love talking about Trek, just 
hit me up on Twitter at Versetrek, and I'll I'll reply. I always do. I'm the lead. And you can find this show on Twitter at Weekly Trek and me at Alexander T. Perry. And if you enjoy the show, please consider leaving us a five-star review on your podcast player of choice. And please check out some of the other great shows on the Tricorder Transmissions. Trek Ranks just dropped its top five Trek Pets episodes. And if you like our shows, please also consider becoming a Patreon of Tricorder, which you can find at patreon.com slash the Tricorder Transmissions. And lastly, if you're looking for Star Trek news on the internet, I hope you will turn to trekcore.com. Well, until next week, thank you, Seth. Thank you to all of my listeners and live long and prosper. Prosper.